Who wants to be their own banker for their own business? Or do you want to just continue paying to the, the banking system? You're either putting this in your pocket or magnitudes more of that money is going out of your pocket. It takes you two to three years to capitalize your own banking system so that for the rest of your life, you now have a perpetual tailwind behind your money and your money will always be more the next day than it was the day before. You didn't have to do anything more to make that happen. This is not a get rich quick thing. This takes time. So whatever your business is, just add that one extra step of being your own bank. Welcome back, everybody. Another week, another Wealth Webinar. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate all the five percenters that love to join us here. Five percenters, that is all of you. If you haven't uh, checked, just look in the mirror. You are the five percent because you're out there creating. You're out there learning something new. You're giving your time, your energy, your effort, and sometimes your money to keep progressing forward and learning more and more. And then you're applying that in your life and you're creating. You know, the other 95 percent, uh, you know, they're on Dave Ramsey's channel. Uh, they're just they're just conforming. They're conforming to whatever they're told, and they don't even ask why. They just do. So with that being said, I am really excited about today's webinar. I've got a couple guests going to be coming on with me the whole time will be Mr. Craig Yenny. Craig, what's going on down there in Colorado? Hey, doing well here. We're just uh, waiting for a big storm to roll in. So we got about two feet of snow coming my way, but uh, that'll just keep me inside working harder. I think one thing we just want to share is, you know, Dave Ramsey's over there teaching baby steps. So we're going to teach how to take monster steps. That's well said. Monster <laughs> steps with uh, sounds like for you going to have some snowshoes on. So they're going to yes. be big monster snowshoe steps. But with that being said, could you please uh, give Mother Nature a call and tell her, uh, send a little bit of that snow out here to Buffalo. She sort of forgot about us this year. Yeah. Uh, hasn't really given us any of that uh that white fluffy snow. And we'd like some pow down these parts. Uh, where's everybody else from while we're doing this? Godzilla's coming. Okay, so Greg must be from Godzillaville. But where's everybody else from? Let's put it in the chat. See how you guys are doing. Hawaii. I love Hawaii. Lucy, good to see you again. Massachusetts. Utah is getting... Utah, you know, for two years, you folks out there have been getting spoiled, freaking rotten. That Like, it's just not fair, man. It's just not fair. You know, some of us over here in the uh, the northerly parts of the country, we're just uh, not getting any of that snow. All right. We got a good showing. Well, hey, hey here's the deal. So today, let me just kind of lay out what we're going to do. We're going to do some really fun stuff. We're going to be teaching you mostly business applications. Okay. So we're going to make today all about entrepreneurs. We're going to make today about the creators. We're going to make today about you, the five percenters. So how many of you are self-employed? Put self in the chat. I just want to know how many of you are self-employed and that that's okay if you work like a W2 and then you got a side hustle, which is your business on the side. Maybe you're buying real estate. Maybe you're doing some private lending that makes you an entrepreneur. And, and here's the unique thing that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about entrepreneurs and we're going to talk about how in their pursuit to solve the problem that their business solves or obtain the dreams and the goals that they want to, that business will need to eventually buy things. It might be simple little things. I mean, maybe you need to buy some, uh, I don't know what these thermos things that you want to give away as marketing. Maybe some of you will need to buy a copy machine, maybe furniture or equipment, maybe cameras and lighting. Maybe you're going to need some trucks and bulldozers and some equipment. Whatever your business needs, you gonna you got to figure out how you're going to buy that. Now, business owners typically would go to a bank and finance that. So we're going to look at that option. We're going to look at what does it look like for an entrepreneur that needs to buy some things. And we're going to use a case study. Craig's going to use a case study of a real client who's got a really cool business, a business that throughout the country has been getting more and more popular because we just accumulate way too much junk. And then when we accumulate too much junk, that junk needs to go somewhere. And it's mm -hmm. just not fun when that junk's all got to go into your garbage cans every week. You know, you take a little out, you're like, you know, you leave a six pack for the garbage man. Hopefully some of you have done that. And you just hope that they're willing to take that extra garbage because you got a lot more the next week and the next week. So we're going to talk about a junk removal business. A junk removal business scales and builds through buying equipment. Obviously, you'd need staff. You'd need customers and marketing. But mostly, you can only build your business if you got more trucks to haul junk away, right? What about landscapers? What about people in the construction business, developers? 
they all need equipment, okay? Sometimes small equipment, sometimes big equipment. Sometimes it's a weed whacker, a lawnmower, a trailer, a truck, whatever. That's all got to be funded somehow. And most businesses go to the traditional bank. And so many of those business owners, especially newer businesses, go to the bank. And the bank's like, I'm sorry, you don't have enough history. That's always the word, history with this bank. We can't issue you the loan unless you put your firstborn, your house, and everything you own up for collateral for this weed whacker loan. Anyway, you get the drip. Banks aren't always friendly to business owners, especially new businesses or businesses that don't show on their tax return high profits. Now, how many of you that have businesses every single year show massive profits on your, on your tax returns? All of you, right? I mean, come on. Isn't that the name of the game? When you own a business, you just want to maximize the amount of profit you, you have to pay tax on on the tax return, right? Oh, some of you actually have a CPA. And that CPA actually finds some expenses and some depreciation and some other things like that. And then your tax return doesn't show a really big profit, but that doesn't mean you didn't make a lot of money. It's just smart business. So then the bank looks at that and being like, whoa, I, I'm sorry, can't give you the loan. So you guys all know where I'm going. The traditional methods to finance your business oftentimes let you down. So then you got to seek alternative ways. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how you can use your own private banking system and a process called the Infinite Banking Concept, pioneered by the late R. Nelson Nash and his book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And the unique thing, the reason I bring that up is everything we've learned, we learned from Nelson Nash's teachings. But not only that, in that book that was created in the late 90s, early 2000s, he had a whole section in that book on, Greg? Equipment financing. Yeah. How to finance things for your business. But yep. the problem is, not that Nelson didn't do a fantastic knock-up job with that equipment financing section of the book, but that is now 10, 20 20, am I right? Is that 24 years old? Holy wow. God. Where did the time go? I, I just did the math in my head. 24 <laughs> years old. Do you think some things have changed in 24 years? Like the cost of equipment, interest rates, maybe interest rates are about the same as they were back then, but a lot's changed. So we felt, or Craig felt, it was essential that we modernized that section. But we're going to also expand on that today. We're going to show you some mathematics behind it. We're going to show you the difference between you doing it the regular way of financing through a bank and then you doing it by changing one thing and creating your own banking system. So these are some of the things we're going to hit, but we're not going to just talk about one case study. We're going to go in and we're going to talk about doing this for anything in your business. And I've also got another guest who will be joining us shortly, and I'll, I'll cue him in in a second. His name's Josh, and Josh is going to be coming on. And he's going to be talking about some money the government's giving out. Yeah, believe it or not, like out of that 5.2 trillion, I almost said billion, but trillion dollars they printed, that that gravy train is still going. And there's some money out there for business owners that were affected during COVID. So I felt, hey, if there's some money on the table that the government wants to give you with no strings attached and you don't need to repay it, I felt like any of you business owners that are looking for expansion, if you can grab a couple nickels or dimes, like why not? So I figured I'd bring Josh on. He'll talk about this new program, what it is, how it works, and then how you can basically, you know, work on trying to get some of that, which I'm also doing the same thing. But uh, yeah, that's like an added bonus. So what does everybody think? Everybody uh, think this topic's going to be a good one for you? Got 116 of you. Put yes in the chat if you think this will be good. I don't know, Craig, everybody just wants to learn about how to buy term and invest the difference, I think, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. But yeah. uh, I guess the other question I'd have for the group is, I'm, I'm kind of curious in the the audience. So we always have kind of a mixture of people that have been here for quite a while. I see a lot of familiar names, but then how many people are here for the first time or just learning about infinite banking? I'm just kind of curious where where the audience is on their, their journey of IBC. So we have some new, okay. Welcome, Tony, Catherine. Anyone else out there kind of new to the concept? Paul, John, awesome. Lisa's got her first policy in the works. Yeah, and one of the things, Chris, as you're talking about trying to get that traditional bank financing, in business, we always have consistent revenue, right? We're always, always getting revenue. And so we can always make our bank financing payments, correct? 
Oh yeah. I mean, every business that I know of and every business I've ever seen has just a consistent, smooth cash flow. I mean, it's like clockwork, man. Just like, that. yeah. But you know, the, I guess the point there is I just want to bring up too, is when you have bank financing, you're on a set schedule, then if you don't pay for your thing, whatever, that's a truck, your lawnmowers, they're coming to get it. And so well, first they start with those annoying collection calls. I mean, you ever had those where they call you every hour and then they call you at one in the morning and midnight and they harass you, even though you've only, you're only a day late. You're not even late. You just, you did a bill pay on your bank and bill pay, mm -hmm. you know, the mail takes way longer and they're literally calling you, harassing you that you are a bad human being. You didn't pay the bank on time. We're going to come take that weed whacker. And you're like, dude, I got proof right here. It was mailed by the bank. And it should be to you. Well, we don't have it and we're foreclosing. I might be sure. being a bit drastic here. Well, perhaps maybe guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> but, but the, you know, some of the things that we're going to teach is not only how to how to implement this process, but all the flexibility it brings to you in the business and in terms of growing your business, having that control. So a lot of what we talk about is how do you control you know, the, the finances, the, you know, the, your whole personal economy or business economy. So. Hey, I want to read something folks. So, you know, many, well, about almost two months ago, you know, myself and our team and many of you started this challenge. We did a 30 day challenge to listen to the strangest secret in the world for 30 straight days. And every day you write down what that, you know, what you took from that. And everybody did that. It was a huge takeaway. Well, I just never stopped. I don't know, I'm on like day number 74 or 75. But today I wasn't reading Strange Secret. I was li or listening to Strange Secret. I was listening to another one of Earl Nightingale's. And, and this came up and I felt like this was really relevant. So I texted to myself, and let me read this to you. Our success or failure has nothing to do with the opinions of others. It has everything to do with the opinions we have of ourselves. The only way to fail is to not try to succeed at anything. Think about that. The only way to fail is to not try to succeed at anything. And, and I know when you're, you hear that, you're like, well, who doesn't try to succeed at anything? I'll tell you, the people that want security don't try to succeed because they just get sucked into a rut. They conform to what their life should look like because someone told them what their life should look like and they just continue through life. I know so many of these people. I have so many of these people in my family. And folks, how many of you can relate? How many of you know that person that just goes through life aimlessly, seeking security, no risk? They just want things just the way they are because they've been told that their life should look a certain specific way and they never strive for more. But how many of those people bitch and moan every day about how they don't you know, make enough money how they should have this and they should have that. And I know a lot of those people, like their family members, are constantly there with their hand out wanting something because I've stretched out, put everything on the line, literally put my entire life on the line to build what we've built today. And because of that, I've had success. But then they think that they are due some success because why? Because I have it and they don't. And that's an interesting thing. But I just, again, want to read that our success or failure has nothing to do with the opinions of others. It has everything to do with the opinion of ourselves. Mm -hmm. All those folks, okay, that, that those negative individuals in your life, think about that. What is their opinion of themselves? And with that being said, I think what I want to do now is I, I just want to give you a good takeaway. I just want to quickly read you something that our attorneys make sure that we do every single time during this. And that is, can anyone guess? Yes, the disclaimer. So I'll get through it quick. Any opinion expressed by me and my castmates is solely our own individual opinion and not investment or personal financial advice. This content is for informational purposes only, and this information should not be relied upon for investment or other financial decisions. Nothing contained here in, herein is financial, legal, or tax advice. Chris Noggle, my castmates, or PMC, or Money School, or Money Multiplier, or its members, employees, contractors, we may receive compensation for advertisements or marketing of third-party products and services. 
Inclusion, inclusion of such advertisements or marketing is not an endorsement, guarantee, or recommendation thereof by Chris Noggle, any castmates, PMC, Money School, Money Multiplier, or its members, employees, or contractors. Use of such products or services are solely at your own risk. Any questions? Good. No, nope, thanks. We are ready to show everybody what it's like to be their own bank. So where should we start? Well, I'm, I'm kind of thinking... <laughs> We don't go through the basics, but I think there are a couple foundational things we need to lay down. And and it, it comes from questions that I get a lot of times. And how do the policy loans work? So if a lot of people will say, well, if I have a, a 5% interest rate, is that really 5%? So let, let's set the table with that one. And then there's a lot of confusion when we talk about financing things through our own banking system. What happens when we pay the our loan back and we still have payments to make, where does that money go? So I, I think we'll just kind of start with that uh, and then we can get into the equipment financing model and kind of share that with the team. I think that's a great idea. I think just giving a baseline because we do have a bunch of new folks on here. Hey, one thing too, I want to bring up, um, this happened twice this week and I think it's just a good like intro not in so much to what we're getting in here, but um, you know, you guys all hear about Index Universal Life. You all know how I feel about it, but that's not important. But one of the things that I cannot let go is the lies. Just just the other day, I got a message, okay, from one of the insurance carriers telling me that one of my good clients was seeking to do a, a transfer, a, a replacement of the whole life policy with an IUL. And I'm just like, holy crap, this, and I'm not going to use the person's name, but this person's doing, what, what am I missing here? So I sent a long email. He responded back with the reasons. The reasons were really not circumstantial or anything. They were basically just, I don't like the service of the insurance company. First thing I'm thinking, which I haven't talked to him yet, I'm thinking, why are you calling the insurance company in the first place? Why aren't you just calling us and then let us help you, which I know I've helped him a couple of times. He did have some issues in the beginning with the insurance company, but hey, that would happen. He said he didn't feel important to the insurance company. No disrespect, but you're probably not. Uh, I don't mean that in a bad way, but the insurance companies are massive, you know, and, and you are just a client of the insurance company and they don't know you different. Like you've got a personal relationship with us at BYOB and, and Money Multiplier, but the insurance company doesn't have a personal relationship with you. So we went through all these reasons. And then he said, you know, this insurance agent, whose name I'll forget, the IUL agent, spent so much time with me creating PowerPoints and showing me the comparison side by side. And he was nice enough to send them over to me. And I started looking at him. And, and the first thing I thought is, I'm going to need a bag to throw up. Because first, first thing I sent back to the client, I said, this PowerPoint, I can't believe this, this, this advisor or agent sent this to you because this is absolutely not compliant at all. Like some of the slides just showed numbers and they didn't give any relevance of that. And now you, well, you got to show, is this the guaranteed columns or is this the hypothetical bullshit column? And it was the hypothetical bullshit compared against the whole life. So they're showing some hypothetical number that is just picked out of the sky. I swear to God, like, ah, oh, let's see what number should today be. Uh, eeny, meeny, money, 6.52. Yes. All right. Let's throw that in there. So all this stuff, I'm going through it, and I'm looking at the illustrations, and I'm just looking at everything. And then I looked at the replacement paperwork. Craig, you're going you're gonna to specifically like this, and then we'll get right into this. And I'm reading, what is the reason how this insurance company, this, this other company that this insurance agent worked for, how could they even substantiate replacing this amazing whole life? Because this person has one of those old 4% guaranteed contracts, mm -hmm. like the goodie contract. You can't even get them yeah. anymore. So- I'm reading it, and, and the reasoning was the client is seeking better living benefits than what are offered by the mass policy. And I'm just thinking, holy shit, what, wait, what? Living benefits. Benefits you probably never use in your life, but maybe if you do, you get a little bit of an extra. So this contract that for this agent had a couple living benefits on there that, that, that ours don't. Because remember, ours are race cars. We're building and engineering a race car to go fast. Fast means money growing fast. Fast meaning money accessible immediately. Like we're not going to put 50 pound weights on the side of our race car and slow it down and make drag. But that's exactly what this particular agent was doing. Literally putting these extra add-ons and using that to substantiate a replacement. Because normally in a replacement, they have to prove why this is better for the client. 
And, and there's no possible way, in my opinion, this aging could prove that. But this little this little thing, that was the only way that I thought that they could do it. Anyway, it's yeah. you know more to come on that. I'm still working on it. But like this is the crap that goes out on out there, folks. Like, don't listen to the fast talking advisors or agents trying to sell you IULs and trying to say why it's better. IULs, by fact, do not work for the infinite banking concept. And I just said it right there. I, I already read you the disclaimer. And that one right there is fact. And it is not just my opinion, but it has been proven so many times also by the IBC practitioners group who does not allow IULs to be used with the same in the same sentence as the word IBC or infinite banking concepts. Just saying. All right. Anyway, off my rant. Yeah. I mean, amen to all that. So, well, let's get into the uh, kind of the use case. And okay. then I just see that Josh joined us. So yep. what we'll, do, we'll go through the use case. And then how many of you would like to see how you might be able to grab some cash for your business from some things that might have happened during the pandemic after we do this? And then we'll dive into the, the equipment financing. Is that good? Well, let's let's cover a couple of quick basic things real quick, and then we'll jump into some of the use case. But a lot of times, I have folks asking me about loan operations. How do the loan operations work within our our own banking system, and and how do you overpay a loan? So if if there's only say twenty five thousand dollars of loan to pay back, how do you overpay that? And and if you do, what happens? So I want to just touch on those basics real quick, like. And how we can do that, you know, I, I tend to relate to the numbers and spreadsheets. Um, I know a lot of people like pictures, but just bear with me. So this is a loan spreadsheet, if you will, where we're taking $10,000 of, of loan out of our policy. And let's say that your, uh, your policy has a 5% loan interest rate. Well, if we don't make any payments on that loan throughout the year, we're going to accumulate $500 of loan interest, right? So 5% of the 10,000 is 500 bucks. What we teach here is we want to be an honest banker. So if I do take a $10,000 loan to maybe go out and buy some, you know, a fancy lawnmower, weed eaters, the chainsaw, the whole bit for my business, I'm going to structure a payment back into my own system of $500 a month. What's happening because this is a simple interest loan that $500, 100% of that, that loan repayment goes to the principal, which buys down the interest rate over time. The other thing that's happening is when you put that $500 back towards a loan, you now have increased your capacity to take that out if you need it again. So for every $500 I'm putting back, that's going back into my cash value, available cash value. But the real magic with the numbers here is if I am paying that $500 back every month, my true loan cost, so this $337 is what goes to the insurance company. My effective rate is now 3.37, not 5%. So that's really the, the main thing I wanted to share. And the more you put back towards that loan, now we're at 2.4%. So the, the, the more you put back towards that loan, the more you become an honest banker, the more benefit you'll have in terms of the the lower uh, cost of of interest. All right. So with that said, let's pretend that you are now going to look at financing something in your business. So whether it's a copy machine, a lawnmower, uh, the one we're going to go through is a junk truck. But let's say that that financing that you need is around fifty two thousand six hundred dollars. And the current rates right now, let's say you go down to the bank and the banker is willing to give you this money at a cost of 8.65% for the next four years. So essentially what we want to look at is we want to gather what is the payment. So the payment's going to be $1,300 a month. And our, our total cost of this loan is going to be about $62,410. So nothing magical here, just a, a straight loan um, for that $52,000. We need to pay about $1,300. Per month. Now, here's where the question comes in most times if we have a third party financing at 8.65. However, our insurance company that we're teamed up with to build our banking system is, is charging 5% loan rate. If I'm going to be an honest banker and I put that $1,300 in every for 48 months, I'm going to overpay my loan, my interest on the, I'm going to overpay the 
the insurance, com insurance company's loan. So what happens to that excess? All right, so where, I know this is kind of small, I'm not gonna go into the numbers in great detail, but this is basically year one, year two, year three. The only thing I wanna make a point of on this, this particular slide is, we are done paying our system back at month 44 or month 43. So what happens to those $1,300 payments for the rest of the, the 48 month term? Well, we have $5,220 that we're going to add back into our banking system that goes into the deposits. So imagine instead of a specially designed whole life policy, we have a bank account. We're just going to take that $5,220 and add that to our deposits. No different when we're using the, the specially designed whole life policy, we're simply going to take that 5,220 and we're going to add it to our premium, which adds compounding for the rest of our life. So that's where the excess is going. So we're gonna go through a case study on equipment financing. And I happen to have uh, a guy up here in North Denver. He actually runs a junk removal business and we've had some really good discussions. He's got a policy. He's building up, he's capitalizing. And right now he works in a particular area of the front range of Colorado. And his whole objective is to buy more trucks. If he buys more trucks, he can serve more cities and he can generate more income for his business. Now, currently they try to do about five jobs a day. Those jobs range between 300 to 350 um, per job. And so, on a you know ballpark, he he kind of mentioned he can get anywhere from 300 to 500 k you know on a truck. So what's going to happen if he can finance another truck or three trucks or four trucks? His business is going to continue to grow. He's going to create jobs. He's going to help people get the garbage out of their garage. And and these are cases where um, you know it could be commercial where someone's moving out an office building and they need to get rid of a bunch of junk or he's cleaning out a garage. Um, so the whole purpose is the more trucks, the more junk we can haul, and the more money we make. So I'm sure a lot of people have similar types of uh, businesses where if, if you have more equipment, you have uh, the ability to make more money. So just as a quick reminder, remember if we are financing a truck, now his trucks are going to run around ninety to hundred thousand. The reason I picked this fifty two thousand six hundred is it actually comes right out of this book. Everyone see this uh, book by Nelson Nash. So we're kind of rebuilding the equipment financing uh, use case that you can find on page 51 of this book. So I'm using the same numbers, but just know that in reality, in today's world, a junk truck is going to run you about 90,000, but the, the concepts are still the same. Now, what I want to look at is if I go to third-party financing, how much is it going to cost me for that truck? Well, I'll make $1,300 payments and net net, I'm going to pay about $62,410 for that truck. What happens if I buy two trucks? Well, now we have 124,000 of financing. What if I buy three trucks? We have $187,000 of financing. Who in this group would like to give all of this to the bank or would like to keep that in your own system? Anybody here would rather keep that in their own system? Or would they rather give it away? Just kind of curious. I know it's a rhetorical question, but of course, everybody wants to keep it. So is there a way we can finance these trucks and keep this money? Well, that's what I want to go through today. In the Nelson Nash um, use case, he, he has a 30-year-old business owner that runs his business for 30 years. And so he's going to buy one truck every four years in that 30 years, or he's going to buy two trucks every four years for 30 years, or he's going to buy three trucks every four years. So I just wanted to paint the picture. If you used third-party financing and you bought eight trucks in that 30-year period, $500,000 leaves your business, leaves your personal economy as well. 16 trucks, you're going to pay close to a million. And then if you finance 24 trucks, that's 1.5 million. So we're talking about a lot of money leaving our business if we simply don't finance our own equipment. Now, Nelson Nash always said we should be in two businesses. We should be in the banking business and we should be in the business that makes our money. 
So if you're a junk hauler, you should be a banker and you should be a junk hauler. So whatever your business is, just add that one extra step of being your own bank. So we've got a, we don't have time to go into all of the details today. However, there are some different policy designs that we can build for your banking system. And just know that our team, all the money mentors we have, if you get on a call with us, anyone on our team, we can help you customize or tailor the policy design to meet your needs and your financing needs. So Nelson Nash always talked about, we need to capitalize and we need to build a system that's going to be big enough to finance the things we need and want in our business. So we have a couple of designs here um, for this use case. One's called the Nelson, the Nelson Nash Special. What Nelson Nash talked about is capitalizing the policy for four years by putting $40,000 in every year. And then he no longer put new money into the policy and started financing. Okay, so that's one strategy. There's another strategy where Nelson Nash did not teach about dump-ins. Think about if you have cash in your business and you wanted to just drop that into the policy, that's what we call a dump-in. So can you take $120,000 and just drop it into the policy and then have a $40,000 ongoing premium? Yes. And so I wanted to show the, the ability to just do capitalization for one year as opposed to four. That's what the half Nelson is. And then Chris has some design videos um, where we name some of the policies. We have one called the beast and the beast is a higher split. So Nelson Nash typically used of that 40,000, 60% would go to that, those rocket boosters or the cash side of the policy. 40% would go to the base. The beast, we take a higher split. So more of our premium is going towards cash and we have less of it going toward the base. So in this case, we might have to add some term. There's some upfront um, benefits, but maybe some longer term trade-offs. And then we've got one that I call the caffeinated beast, where we're actually doing a dump in with a high split. So really what we're, I'm just laying out here is there's different designs. We can customize or, or tailor these to however you, your business needs to build this financing model. But let's run through the Nelson Nash special real quick here. So what do we mean by capitalizing? So Nelson Nash would always teach, build your system first. So he's putting in $40,000 for four years and he's not using any of the money. You could, but in, in the example he's, he's putting together and we're also reproducing is we're just putting that 40,000 in and then we're not putting any more premium in after that, other than this, this minimal uh, cost to keep the, what's called the PUA writer open. All right, so pretty simple. We're just capitalizing for four years. No more new money's going in. And now we've got a banking system that we can start to finance. So you'll see over here, we keep track of how much did we deposit into our bank? How much did we take out in loans? And what was the dividend of the growth of the policy? How much is the cash value? And then I'm also keeping track of the cumulative deposits that are put into the banking system. And although we're talking about a banking system, we don't want to forget that there's this thing coming along for the ride called the death benefit. So we've got over $733,000 of death benefit here if something were to happen to this business owner. So let's carry this on down to the age when they're 66. How much cash value do they have? They've got $398,000 of cash value and they put in 163,000. What I'm representing here is you've done nothing. You've built the system and then you didn't use it. This is just how it grows over time. So if you've got a pencil and a paper, write down this, this number. You can just write down 400,000 to make it simple. Um, so we're gonna keep track of that number. Let's see, Terry, Terry said, is there an age limit on being able to use this process? Like can someone uh, retirement age basically still use the system? Yeah, so this system can be used for people that are in retirement. Um, what it starts coming down to is, is your body the one that should be insured or do you have another insurable interest if if that doesn't work out? So we have a lot of cases where, you know, someone that's maybe in retirement that maybe has some health issues would use a insurable interest, could be a family member, business partner. 
So there are some options there, and that's where we could we could kind of take that offline and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of our money mentors. But absolutely, Terry. Now what we're going to do, now that we've capitalized, we have at the end of year four, we have 141,000 of capital that we can use in our banking system. So what we're going to do is finance one truck. Remember the financing for one truck was $52,600. And we we're paying $1,300 a month back into the system. So essentially, the by the time we pay $15,600 of loans, we have about $37,000 that really goes towards the loan that first year that we finance our truck. So what you'll see is we're, we're now going to start paying our system back. We took the $52,000 out, bought our first truck. So at the end of year one, we've got a remaining loan balance of about $38,000. we are going to continue on at year two. We have a balance of about $24,000 left on our loan. And then we have $9,000. So here's where it gets fun because we're paying our system back $15,600 in a year, but I only owe $9,253. dollars So where does that extra $6,347 go? right back into the deposits of our own banking system. Every time you see additions into this column, that's adding to the ongoing compounding, that's adding to the death benefit, that's adding to the growth of our policy. So remember, all we're doing is being an honest banker. This didn't necessarily come out of any extra income. It's just financing and we ran out of room paying the loan back. So we're just going to put that into our deposits. Now here's the fun part about it. We've paid off the first truck. Now we've got the junk business is now generating say 300,000 more in revenue. Let's do it again, let's buy another truck. So in year nine, we're going to buy another truck and we're just going to continue doing this. And we're going to buy a total of eight trucks through this 30 year period. And we're just going to keep doing the same thing and over and over. It's repetition at this point. We're gonna continue adding that 6,347 on the, the last year of our financing and just keep doing that over and over. So we get down to age 66, and remember I said to write down the number on that cash value where we built the system, we capitalized, and we did nothing with it. Does anyone remember what that number was? Can you put it in the chat? Well, is everybody up? Oh, 40K, 400K. All right, we got some 400Ks. So the cash value, if we capitalize the system and do nothing, was about 400000 so isn't that really cool how we just picked up $100,000 by simply financing our own truck? There was nothing magical going on here other than financing our own truck and we just picked up another $100,000 of cash value in our policy. Now the question would be, if one truck every four years is building our business another $300,000 revenue, can we do two trucks? Well, let's take a look. Oh, before I go there, I just wanna do a quick summary on this. So in the in the financing of one truck every four years, and yes, hope houses, whatever it is, I mean, it, it's this truck could be swapped out for a house. This truck could be swapped out for more lawnmowers, or maybe you have a Turo business. This could be another rental car. Um, what I want to show here is just in this this first instance of buying one truck every four years, instead of losing five hundred thousand dollars over that thirty year period you actually gained $286,000 because you have a cash value of 500,000. You actually put 213 into the system. So one of the things that we, we do with this model is we kind of just take a snapshot and say, well, if at age 66, you want to retire on and use this money for some income, depending on how you use that, maybe you take some of it and put it into private money club or um, imagine that this guy sells the business to somebody else and he says, hey, well, I'll finance trucks for you. Well, he could start generating retirement income by financing trucks for the next guy. The powerful thing about this whole model and this process is instead of losing 500,000, we have 286 uh, that we gained. So that's a pretty significant difference. But let's move on to what would it look like if we finance two trucks? So now our, our loan amount gets bigger because we now have two trucks. We're now paying $31,200 back into our system in, in um, loan payments. Now, at the, 
the fourth year we only have eighteen thousand to to pay back, but yet we're putting in thirty one thousand. So that remainder of twelve thousand six hundred ninety four goes back into our into our system, and we just keep doing that over and over and over. Okay, so we already know that if we capitalize and do nothing with our policy, we had about four hundred thousand of cash value. Now by financing two trucks every four years, we've picked up another hundred thousand. So now we're two hundred thousand and the plus here. So you see what's going on. It just keeps getting better and better with the more trucks we finance. So look what happened here. Instead of losing a million dollars by financing with someone else's bank, we now have 340,000 gained in our own system. All right, so that's pretty cool. Now the question is, can we finance three trucks with this system? Yes, we can. And so we're now going to just keep running this over and over. Now, I'll just tell you right now, if you said, can you finance four trucks with this system? The answer would be no. We don't have enough capitalization to build uh, a financing model for three trucks every four years. But in this case, we're now adding 19,000 into our picture, into our uh, deposits every four years. So now we're at 705,000 just by simply financing those trucks in our own system. And now instead of losing 1.5, 5 million, we've picked up about 390. So you get the picture. Now, just to time sake, I am going to run through um, a couple of quick examples of different policy designs. So what would it look like if we just capitalized for one year? So now I'm going to capitalize for one year and then start financing. We have a little bit less um, cash value if we simply capitalize for one year and then don't do anything else. So comparing that to Nelson's strategy of 40,000 for four years, we come up with a little difference, you know, 20, 30,000. But what happens if we start financing in year two? Because we put that dump in, we now have the capital where we can start financing our first truck. So in the, the first case, we had about 500,000 in cash value by financing one truck. Now we're at 494. So can't we make the, the, the assumption that it, it's pretty similar whether we we capitalize for four years or we do a dump in and, cap, and capitalize in one year? So hopefully for people that want to build the system faster with a dump in, you'll get some idea that, hey, this still works. Now I'm just kind of showing the summary. We've, got, we've still got a gain of about 280,000 by using this dump in strategy as opposed to the four year capitalization. So we're still, whether you decide to capitalize for four years or you do the dump in, I would venture to say it's still very beneficial. So let's um, let's jump down and, and look at what if we do two trucks. So now if I do two trucks, now I'm making a $350,000 gain. Who here thinks I can get away with financing three trucks with this dump in strategy? Anybody want to venture to say I can or I can't? So Felix thinks we can finance three trucks. Anyone else have a, a thought whether we can finance three trucks or two? Well, let's find out. Breaking news, this just in. Are you sick of having your money lying around not doing anything? Well, we've got the solution for you. PrivateMoneyClub.com. Back to you, Chris. All right, so here we are. We've capitalized. For one year, we have an excess of 19,000 going in, and then we have 18,731. And at the end of this strategy, we have 409,000, but there's a red alert here. We're trying to do too much financing with too little capital. What do we mean by that? Do you see what happens here? We are only able to put in 18,731. So we're $310 short. We have $310 that we can't get into the policy. The reason we can't get that into the policy is there's a rule called the MEC rule. The IRS is always watching to make sure we don't take advantage of this system where we're putting in too much cash in relation to the death benefit. So you might say, well, 310, not a big deal. But the, the premise here is we always have to be careful that we're we're not going to try to finance too much in our business without putting in enough capital. So Jared says he is lost. He doesn't understand this. Well, let's go back. Let's go back up one. 
So when we're financing three trucks, we're going to make $1,300 times three because each truck is going to be $1,300. So let's just take that 1,300 times three times 12. So that means we're going to pay our system back $46,800 a year in loan payments. Which, Craig, is the same money that a business owner would give to a bank or a leasing company or a financing company. It's the same dollars. Absolutely. So, so you're going to, payment. yeah, you're either going to give this away or you're going to put it in your system. So look what happens to the loan balance. We we drop it down from 116 to 73. In year three, the loan balance is only 27,000. 759 but we are honest bankers so we are going to pay our system back the 46,800 that we would have given to somebody else where does that extra different where's that difference of 46,800 minus the 27,759 where does that go that goes into our deposits so that $19,041 goes into our deposits now what happens the next time we try to do that, we don't have enough room in our premium, in our deposits. So I can't get the full 19,041 in, I can only get 18,731. And that is a restriction by the IRS on what we call the MEC rules, the Modified Endowment Contract Rules. If you put in more than this, this whole system becomes taxable and we don't want that. And the important thing for everybody to understand is you don't need to understand or know how to calculate the MEC rules. We do all of that, but we're also going to make sure that you don't overfund your policy and create a taxable event, which is what this is right here. So this is just a fancy way of looking at like what we would see on the back end when we were building this model for you, because every one of you are going to have a different use case. Like we're just showing you junk removal trucks in this case study, but whatever yours is, we can run like it's called a, a customized gains report or, or debt blaster report, and we'll figure out how to solve your problem. And then we'll basically tell you what you can and cannot put in. Because there was a couple of questions of how much more money can I put in? Again, every year that changes because yeah. of the dividends and because of the MEC rule calculation. But we do all that. So if people get confused, like, oh, my God, I wouldn't know how to do that. Good. You're like, I hope to God you don't know how to do that. Like, <laughs> that's our job. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's it's just like when you go into a, you know, get a suit or a business suit, you know, they're going to tailor that suit to fit you. And that's what we do. We tailor these policies to fit what you're trying to accomplish. So if you came to me and said, Hey, I want to finance three trucks every four years. And I want to dump in 120,000, put 40,000 of premium in, I would be able to come back to you and say, there's not enough capital here to do what you want to do. So we're going to have to put more into the system or finance less trucks, but that's what we can help you with. So just for time's sake, I'm going to just blast through these last two real quick because the beast is still capitalizing 40000 per year for four years, but we're going to change the split, meaning we're going to put more money towards the cash writer of the policy, less towards the base. Nelson Nash was, was always using a 60-40, but I wanted to show the audience what it looks like for a 75-25. So we'll just jump right down. We're going to finance, you know, one truck every four years again. And what we find here is that, you know, we're we're going to, let me just jump up to here. If you remember in the 60-40 model, we had about 500,000 at the end of this um, cycle of, of equipment financing. Here we have 589,000. So we're actually able to stick a lot more cash into the, the policy than we were with the 60-40. Um, so we're, we're just going to be able to, to show you what is the benefit of using a 60, 40 versus 75, 25, and all of that comes down to the, the design of the, of the policy. Okay. So I'm going to jump through these and just go right down to the third case. Now, the question would be, can I finance three trucks every four years with this design? The answer is yes. So if we go back and look at this, I can get the full 19,161 in every year. So this is part of, not that we need to go through all the numbers in great detail right now, but to Chris's point, this is what our team's going to do for you is if, if we set you up with the beast policy design and you want to finance three trucks every four years, yes, we'll be able to show you that this, this model will have enough capacity for you. 
could you do four trucks? No, you can't do four trucks. There's not enough money in the system to do four trucks. And the last one um, is the caffeinated beast. And what I mean by the caffeinated beast is we're going to do a dump in with a higher split than Nelson Nash top. So we're going to do that 75-25. That's one of the and, huge differences between policies today and policies back when Nelson did the book is we have figured out ways, and not only that, just things have changed where we can put a lot more money in these policies without mecking them than they could do back then. So we can build them not only to have higher early cash value than back then, but also to be more efficient. And that's kind of what you're seeing from these numbers. Absolutely. So here we're here we're putting in the 160 on a higher split. So if we just look at this, this policy design, if you go back to the very first one I showed, remember I said write down 400,000. Well, now we're at 468. So by juicing this policy sooner, we actually end up with more cash value in the system, which is which is interesting. Now, we're going to go through and finance one truck and no problem, we can finance one truck. If you remember the, in the Nelson Nash special, we had about 500,000 in cash value after financing one truck. No shock here, we're, we've got more going to cash, so we, we're going to end up with more cash value at the end. Um, so now we're about 85,000 higher in cash value compared to that, that Nelson Nash special. So well, we've got the summary here. Um, you guys get the, get the picture. Now when we get to two trucks, but what I want to show you is the three trucks. So here we are again, where we want to put in 46,800 in our loan repayment. We have $27,000 of loan to pay back in, in year four. So we have 19,041 that we can put into the policy and it fit the first time. But look what happens the next time, the next, you know, the subsequent times we do the, the financing. I can't get the full 19,000 and I can only get 15,129. So guess what? Again, we have too much financing with too little capital. So we're now not able to put in that $3,912 every four years. So what do we do with that? If this was really a your situation, what could you do that with that money? Well, you could set it aside in a segregated account, use it for other business purposes, start another policy. You could go save on it up and go on vacation. Go on vacation. You could buy the new big screen TV. You could go on a trip. You know whatever you want to do with it. But that's just extra cash that won't fit into the the financing system. Now this is the this is the wrap up. It's a lot of numbers, but what I wanted to show here, the way you read this is each of these boxes is one of those policy designs. So the Nelson Nash special, where we capitalize 40,000 for four years on the 60-40 design. We've got the half Nelson, where we did a dump in year one, still on a 60-40. We've got the beast, where we capitalized 40,000 for four years, but we used a higher split, a 75-25. And then the caffeinated beast, which was that dump in year one with the 7525. So the way to look at these is how many trucks did you finance? So that would be, you know, if you didn't finance any trucks, if you financed eight, 16, or 24, how much did you deposit into the system? So this came out of your business income. This is what you put into your financing system. What was the cash value at the end of that 30 year period where you financed eight trucks, 16 trucks, 24 trucks? What was your actual gain? What were your dividends? What were your death benefits? So if you just kind of look at some of the gains, um, let's just kind of pick out some of the high points here. So who's got the highest gain by financing 24 trucks over that course of that period? Well, this one's 390, that's 472. The winner is the caffeinated beast as far as having the most cash value at 468,000. Now, do you remember... In the caffeinated beast, we were not able to put that 3,912 into the system. So even though we couldn't fully repay the loans, we still had the most cash value with that design. Does that mean that capitalizing the Nelson Nash 40,000 for four years at 60, 40 is a bad design? Not at all. I'm just simply showing you the ability that you can do a big dump in with a high split but it needs to be designed properly to make sure we can get enough of your um, business financing in there. 
what do you guys think about this? Who wants to who wants to be their own banker for their own business? Or do you want to just continue paying to the, the banking system? Craig, I think the biggest thing that this whole thing shows is how much money business owners are actually giving away, like how much they're losing year yeah. over year just for running their businesses and buying the things that they need to operate and to scale their business. And when you when you start seeing the mathematics behind it, and I know folks, there's a lot of numbers here. Some of you are like, you know, you're just having a hard time tracking the numbers, but it's pretty simple. All we're doing is just showing instead of financing your 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 businesses, you know, purchases the equipment in this case, you know, through a bank, you're you're doing it through your policy, and then you're just taking the monthly payments you would have paid to a bank. You know, because most people make monthly payments to a bank, a leasing company, a financing company. You're just making those same payments back to your policy. But see, then you're controlling that money. In this case, it was thirteen hundred bucks a month. Every thirteen hundred dollar payment you put back in your policy as a loan repayment is thirteen hundred dollars your business has the next day. If you were to buy these vehicles using financing through a bank, every thirteen hundred dollar payment goes to their bank and you don't get that money back to use for your business. It's just cost of doing business. Here, it's not a cost of, it is a cost of doing business, but it's a cost of doing business that adds money to your balance sheet, to your cash position on the balance sheet, which is the single most important part of the balance sheet. Also, what that helps the business do is scale faster because now in the event of massive growth in a business, let's say this junk removal business needed to go from four trucks to 10 for a big expansion, they're not going to be able to maybe capitalize their banking system fully to do that, but they could take these policies, show them to the bank, and now their balance sheet shows the cash value and all the recaptured amounts that now adds to their, their ability to leverage and get bank financing in the future. So either way, you're winning. And then any here's what I've done in mine, and Craig knows this, and you know, in my business, I have used bank financing to buy things, but I immediately then try to find a way to take my policy and buy out the bank financing. As of recently, I've done this four times with rental properties that I had I had mortgages with banks. Those mortgages started to mature out of the, the rate locks. I started taking loans from my policy, buying out the bank. So I no longer owe the bank the mortgage. I then put myself, me, in the first lien position with a mortgage. And I make those same exact monthly payments I used to pay to the bank, but I pay them back to my policy. So for my business, the cash flow model didn't change. Matter of fact, the cash flow model is better because the bank was going to increase my payment because the rate was going to go up. But now because I'm in control and I'm the bank, I'm making payments back to my policies, the same amounts I was given the bank. Nothing changed except for now I keep all the money. Most businesses are going to do the same thing. Some have the ability, like Craig showed, to just pre-fund their, their banking policies. And if you do, all the better. I never had that. I had to do it the slow grind way, which is just the monthly deposits I would make into my policies. But listen, it took me you know, the better part of a decade, what might take you guys three, four years. Think about that. You can condense time because now you know how to do it. Where well, I didn't know this stuff. This stuff really ex it existed back then, but we weren't able to math show the math on it. Things have come a long way, Craig. They really have. Yeah, and I, I think James put a James put a comment in the the chat, and I mean, he hit a nail on the head. It's 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 the benefits of time and having having some time to capitalize to build the system. I mean, it's over the length of of your business. I mean, you look at these numbers, and you're either putting this in your pocket or magnitudes more of that money is going out of your pocket and. I think in in all the numbers, the wall of numbers, as you call them, Chris, I mean, we're just trying to show the benefits new, new mathematically, but you really have a choice for every dollar that you have, whether it's personal or whether it's in your business, every time it goes somewhere, do you want to run it through the through your own banking system first so it compounds and grows for the rest of your life or give it away? It's that lost opportunity cost. And, and with all these numbers, that's really what it comes down to is you just have a decision where do you want that dollar to go first? And I think James Davidson said something important. He said, you can only do that because you have seasoned your banking system, the benefits of time. So the other mm -hmm. thing too, that all of you must, must understand that this, this is not a get rich quick thing. You'll notice like when you were looking at the years, this takes time. You can speed that time up by front loading or dumping money in as we showed, but literally like building your own bank takes time. It takes time to capitalize your bank. It takes time to season your bank. But listen, like I, I just, 
I sometimes just can't relate with people when they say, oh, I wouldn't do this because it takes, you know, two or three years to get your, your system up to the efficiency point. Like that's just a wasted two to three years. It takes you two to three years to capitalize your own banking system so that for the rest of your life, you now have a perpetual tailwind behind your money and your money will always be more the next day than it was the day before. And you didn't have to do anything more to make that happen. I had to give up two or three years for that. So the rest of my life, I had efficiency behind my money. I'm sorry, sign me up every day. But there, believe it or not, folks, I mentioned the 95%. There are folks that won't do this because of that. They want instant gratification. This is not for them, period. And it never will be because that instant gratification only comes with significant risk and it almost always backfires. Those are the people that come crawling back to us all the time, Craig. How many of those do we have? A lot. I mean, it's, 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 it's phenomenal when, when people finally catch on how this works, it's, you know, and you and I are in the same boat. Like I think about all the, all the cars I used to buy in the past or all the things I used to finance and that money's gone. It, it's, it's out of here. I'll never see it again, but 100%. no more. Everything runs through, through the, the personal banking system at this point. Well, uh, Craig, th this is awesome, but I want to make sure I allow Josh enough time to talk about, yeah. you know, the uh, self-employed credits, which is part of, you know, I'll have him explain it, but I, I read through the whole thing, watched a bunch of videos on this, and it's, you know, it's all part of that, that bill that they passed during the pandemic. And, you know, we know about the EDIL loans. We, we knew about the PPP loans. There was all sorts of programs to help businesses. And there's also programs still going on now which is what I wanted to have Josh come on and explain. So Josh, I'm just going to kick it over to you and let you kind of explain this new program, how it could benefit any of the self-employed individuals on here, myself included. And Craig, this might even benefit you, but yeah, I'd love to it. hear it. Hey, Josh. Hey, uh, pleasure to be on. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on, Chris. You're welcome. And uh, good to meet you, Craig, and uh, everyone else on the, on the call. You know, to kind of echo what you guys have been talking about, um, I've been a huge proponent and uh, believer in uh, being your own banker from Nelson Nash's uh, book 30, 40 years ago. So uh, I think you guys are doing awesome things with that. Thanks, man. Yeah. So uh, when Chris and I were talking this last couple of weeks, I was uh, mentioning to him because, uh, you know, I guess a quick story about myself, my background, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, serial entrepreneur, and I've been in real estate for 20 years and uh, primarily in the commercial real estate space, you know, triple net stuff in the last like six, seven years. And I had a business in 2019, 2020 in the oil business that, uh, that was suffering because of the pandemic. And, uh, and with that, I was just trying to find extra stimulus, you know, for that business and uh, came upon different programs. And then the ERC program came out about March, 2021. I saw at the very end of March, 21, first part of April, Reached out to my CPA at the time, uh, which was Robert Kiyosaki's C CPA, Tom Wilwright, and uh, basically asked him if he could help me. And uh, he's like, "Well, this is a payroll credit. You know, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't do that. Talk to your payroll company." So I reached out to my reps at Gusto and ADP. You know, they both said, "Hey, we don't amend. We just do active returns. So you have to talk to a third party service." I talked to a couple third parties with me and a couple partners, and uh, we just decided, like, "Hey, this is something that we could do." And uh, you know, fast forward to today. That was ERC specialist, um, and the ERC program pretty much took a halt. Uh, we don't, we're not taking new customers on since the end of January. But in the last like four or five months, uh, we discovered another program for people that were self-employed. So if you were 1099, if you were uh, you know sole proprietor, you know anytime it, that in that regard during the pandemic, you can get up to thirty two thousand two hundred dollars within the program. And so there's there's a couple ways to qualify, and I'll just go over them real quick. One is if you had if you had COVID and you weren't able to uh, to conduct business, you you just got you don't you just got to test to it, you know, on which days you did have that. If you had someone in the business um, or that, that you're conducting business with that you know had COVID that you weren't able to conduct business with them, that's another way. So there's all these ors, um, and when you go through the questionnaire, that's the easiest way. And I know uh, Chris is going to uh, post what that link is. Um, so there's kind of two parts to this one on the customer side, you know, cause we, uh, on the ERC side, we ended up being the largest in the country. We did about 70,000 companies and uh, we're obviously really proud of that. We, we think with this one, we'll hit three times that and it's for the next about 18 months. So there's a, there's a smaller runway than there was with ERC, which is about a, it was ended up being a three-year run, runway, but on the customer side, 
Um, when you go through the questionnaire, it doesn't cost anything. You'll put your information in there. And at the very end, they'll tell you um, what you could get up to on your qualifications. So you have to put like there's a calendar, you know, that you put which days. Maybe you don't remember the exact day. That's that's going to be fine. But you try to do your best on when uh, when you were affected those days. Um, and at the very end, they'll say, like for me, I was uh, I end up getting up to eighteen thousand dollars. And then uh, then it takes about three or four days once you say, yeah, I want to kind of see uh, and move forward. Um, it took me about three or four days to come back and the office came back and said, you're approved for $14,752 and some cents. Uh, do you want us to uh, file it for you? At that point, there's the fee is $2,000. Uh, so it's not a percentage or anything. It's $2,000 on whatever you were uh, approved for. Um, and granted, there is people that come back, they're approved for 1500 bucks. So it doesn't make sense for them um, to file. We're, we're working on another system to possibly help people even though it's 1500 bucks to maybe file it for um, a different price. But, you know, the money that we put into it, you know, is, is quite a bit to, uh, to file it. At that point um, you pay the fee and then it takes about six to 20 weeks to receive the money. At which point uh, then you receive the money and, and, you know, all is good. The money is, doesn't have to be paid back. So this isn't a loan. This is uh, this is money that they've already allotted for this program uh, that they budgeted for it. But yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much one side of it. The other side is that, you know maybe because uh, we end up having about forty fifty thousand affiliates nationally, um, and if it's something that like hey maybe you know a lot of people in your area that would be able to take advantage of this and want to make a little bit of extra money on the side, you know Chris can send out that link as well uh, that we have for, for individuals. So with that said, um, I guess any questions, um, questions and. Concerns, we can certainly go over that. What if you were, oh, what if you never had COVID? There's other ways to qualify. I would definitely go through the questionnaire and see maybe you can qualify or not. There's been a lot of people that have, they kind of pre-qualify themselves. And I would say go through the questionnaire because there's other ways to qualify. Yeah. And then Peter said, uh, spoke to my CPA who says not worth doing because of audits uh, pending. So it's not going to work for everybody, right? And what he's referring to is the ERC side. Uh, there has been audits. They're called I, um, IVRs on our side, um, and that's on the ERC side. So I haven't seen one audit um, on the self-employment tax credit side. Yeah, this was brand new. And, and I, I know when uh, you sent me over all that stuff, you know, I had to go through it all and read it. I mean, it was pretty in-depth stuff. I mean, the rules, you know, and everything on it were were pretty to the point, but there's a lot of ways you can qualify for this is, you know, if you're self-employed through the pandemic and, and, you know, someone uh, just commented about uh, squatters and I was commenting back that I had a little squatter problem too, but, you know, I, I just think, uh, you know, when you guys are looking at this, don't exclude yourself just for one reason or the other, just go to that link and see if you qualify. I mean, all the reasons are there. If you legitimately had one of those reasons, then, you'll know. I mean, it, it's, a, it's very short exercise. It really is. Yeah. I mean, it really, I'd say it's 10, 15 minutes to, you know, it's kind of like the, the Geico, you have 10, 15 minutes to save 15%. So you have a chance to, to uh, receive money that you were earned uh, through the pandemic. Wait, now I know this is brand new, but I mean, have you been seeing any kind of an average amount that you're getting for the new people kind of coming into this? I know it's like, I don't know how old this is, a couple of weeks old now. It's 18,000 is the average that we're seeing is what our data is saying. And just so you know, too, I mean, I saw another question um, on the audit side. That's, again, that's the ERC side. Uh, that's not the SETC, what we call SETC. Um, in addition to one thing that made us unique is we have a direct connection API with the IRS. So we get to see what stuff comes back three weeks before people receive it in the mail now. So meaning like we get to see what the IRS agent sees on their computer, uh, which there's probably, I'd say not even five people, five other companies I know that that have that in the nation. Hey, does uh, that little link that you have allow you to go on and see if I'm on an audit list? That would be good information to know. <laughs> on the ERC side, I no, can certainly no, have I'm, my... I meant on the IRS CTO. side. I was, I was joking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you got direct access to see something from the IRS. I'm like, uh, let's hack into this thing and see what they know about me. Yeah. It's not that type of... Uh, access I, but it's totally it's paperwork you. totally uh, messing with you uh let's see it does sound like a double-edged sword yeah so i think that's anyone have any questions about this pretty self-explanatory you go to that link that i just put up there you just kind of go through it and see if you qualify if you do great if you don't sucks to be you i'm just kidding but kind of does 
Because if the average is eighteen thousand bucks, I don't know a business owner that wouldn't like an extra eighteen grand. And, yeah. and also, I know you said this, but I just want to re reiterate this. So if somebody qualifies and then they get the check, it's money they don't have to pay back. So it's not like the EDIL or you know the PPPs if you didn't qualify. Right. Yeah. So like like ERC, you don't have to pay back. Uh, this is the exact same. So it's not a loan. You know, and, and even let's say someone on this. Uh, call has even back taxes. So what they do is they just take that, they deduct that. Um, so if you owed 40 grand, now it's going to be deducted a little bit from that too. So we've already had customers that have had gone through that uh, realm and uh, they're actually more appreciative because they're like, wow, I was kind of getting worried that IRS is going to be knocking on my door pretty soon, but luckily that got taken away as well. So yeah, so there's, but yeah, you don't have to pay it back. And the logistics, again, you pay it up for it front and then uh, it comes in six to 20 weeks. Okay. Couple more. Cindy asked, uh, "Do you have do you have to have uh, made a certain amount? In other words, like a certain amount of income?" Nope, nope. And that's why the questionnaire. You don't want to pre-qualify yourself uh, when you go through it. I mean, I've had people that were Uber drivers, uh, DoorDash drivers that uh, it was almost thirty to forty percent of their salary. So it has nothing to do with that. Um, I mean, they take they take certain uh, parameters in, a, in like in account that we that we have to do. Uh, that the IRS, you know, sent out on how do we have to calculate it, but it's not, it's not related to that. Cindy also said, so do you have to pay the fee before you know how much you will get back? And this is what we talked about before, you know, we went live. Yeah. So um, when you are there to pay the $2,000, you know, to the penny on what you're going to receive. It's like, so someone says, so the net is, yeah, $2,000 less than what you're going to, um, what you're seeing. So if it's 18000 Obviously, it's going to be a net of 16000 just like, you know, anything you pay for. Uh, that's going to be the net. Any requirements of how I use the money from Dustin? Nope. Nope. You can use it for whatever you want in your business. Uh, Drew said, so if I had a schedule SE in 2020 and then converted to an S Corp in 2021, I would only qualify for 2020. Most likely. So again, when you go through the questionnaire, it's going to ask certain questions like that. And then it'll tell you what you're um, approved for. Good. This one's a good one. Uh, Tess says, what are the deadlines for filing this? Because I know it's a short runway. That's actually a great question because um, right now it's up to $32,200. As of April 15th, it goes down $8,000. So I would definitely encourage you guys, um, it's obviously not a sales pitch, but it is going to go down and it's going to go down every quarter thereafter. All right. And then uh, Jose said, I just want to make sure, is this something that we do ourselves?" or the accountants? That's a good question. A lot of people would be like, should my accountant do this or is this something I do myself? Yeah, great question. So this is amending um, your returns to get the, what they call an overpayment from the IRS. And so with that, what we decide to do as far as a company, it's, it's all automated, but on the back end, we're the ones that are helping you amend it. So you don't need to get uh, with your tax pro on it. That's, what, that's the payment, uh, what you're paying for. All right. Celeste said, can you qualify with a W-2 job with a side hustle? like a side business? I would think so, right? So if you had a W-2 job and you had some sort of 1099 gig, would would you still qualify? Yeah, you you would. I mean, you, again, it's going through that questionnaire, it's, it's going to ask certain questions on what your taxes look like because it's going to say, you know, like here's an example. What did line 14 say on your 2020 returns? And then you're going to go to that page and then you're going to type it in and you're going to do that through the questionnaire. And so it's going to recognize, you know, stuff that you've already done. All right, Josh. Well, I got the link up there. I got a couple of people that were interested in possibly learning how they can actually help their folks out. So I'll have them email me directly. So I'll put my email in there if you want that link. I just, I don't have that link at this station. It's over at my other computer, but I'm happy to email it to you. Oh, yeah. And uh, Josh, do you, have a, do you have a website? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the website's in that link, but uh, it's selfemployedcredits.com is the actual site. Selfemployedcredits.com. All right, Josh, man, thanks so much. Thanks for being patient and letting us get through the uh, equipment financing. So this was a, a perfect add-on in today's session because it was all about businesses and self-employed, the five percenters. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Chris. All right, man. Thanks, thanks. guys. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, Heine, you had a question. You still with us, Heine, in the chat? Uh, put down if you're still here. It said, uh, let's see, dump, blah, 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 blah. So I think the question was basically, they, they've got their application pending, okay? They're doing a dump in with the premium deposit uh, and hopefully it gets approved. I'm sure it will, it just takes time. Uh, let's see, then they're saying if they take a loan from the policy, 
uh, is there any way you could help to invest it? So we cannot, uh, unfortunately, we can't help you invest it. I mean, I, every week we have new opportunities on here. Privatemoneyclub.com uh, has opportunities every day. Like I just, here, I'll just go to it, refresh. So Philip Tudor has three available lending opportunities. Let's actually go into the deal section. Section You really don't, I mean, kind of what I'm trying to tell you, Heine, is you don't need my help on Private Money Club. Um, the deals literally are just, it's kind of like walking into an apple orchard that just had its blossom. Uh, they're there. Holy crap. First, I, I got to show this. This is exactly what I mean about apples falling off the tree. Look at this. First thing I see right here, 20% in six months or less. Great multifamily. Well, that one's worth opening. 390 grand. So, you know, one person could take that down. Experienced flipper. So she's been, she's been around the campfire for a little bit. Uh, looking to make this mansion with great bones grand again. Look at that house. That thing's sick. Wow. Dang. That is nice. I'd want to know a lot of information about what the, uh, the rehab budget is on a monster like that, but rents are under market fund use for the gap. So it's just gap funding. So that means um, this particular member has a lot of their own capital going in. So, but I mean, I, I'm not trying to promote her deal specifically. I'm just saying there's tons of deals, 15% on a six month JV. Here's another 20% on a four month. That one's interesting. 25, holy, this shit, this is getting out of control. 20% on four month term working with experienced flipper. The only thing I don't like there is no photo. So I would, I would pass on that one uh, just because there's nothing, you know, photo, same thing here. So I don't know. We'll have to see what's going on with those as to why they don't have photos. It just seems a bit bizarre that those three didn't have photos. Well, you can see here's another one, 20%, eight unit rehab building, 15% ROI. This guy's been around for a while too. So I just noticed some of the faces. This is why it's so important, folks. If you go on privatemoneyclub.com, put a photo of yourself. These guys are partners, Dwight and Brandon. So I mean, like when I'm going through here, like I know who I want to lend to and I know these folks. So if I come to one and there's no photo, like that's a nice couple. Everybody here had photos, but make sure you have photos on there. But behind me, that's kind of what I was just referring to. Like you don't, you don't really need us to, tell you what to do and nor can we because we can't give you investment advice um, but you can just go on the site create a profile and then just pick through set up calls with the particular borrowers and see which one fits your fancy um, there's definitely lots of deals for the amount that you're mentioning on there i just didn't want to put that out there i mean i've got i just looked at three or four that are five thousand more than the number you put in uh, but i'm sure you could work a deal with them and uh, let's see underwriting and escrow attorney you're asking about an escrow attorney. They're not hard to find. What If you're going to be the lender, one piece of advice I'll give you is always control the flow of money. So how I do it when I lend money, outside of a couple of the ones that I built trust with, like the Fullers or Chris Rude, I'll, I'll use their title company. But every other one, if it's a new relationship, I will then send my funds to my attorney's escrow account. And then my attorney will get all the documents in place from, from the note to the mortgage, make sure everything's there, title report. And then once everything's done, signed, recorded, my attorney will send the funds to the borrower's title company. I control the flow and I make, this might not always work folks. So just take this as, as what I do. I make the borrower pay my attorney's fees. That's just how it works. Like I have the money. I'm going to lend to you. My attorney charges 600 bucks to do the escrow and all the paperwork. Like you're paying my attorney. It's just going to be part of the closing docs that my attorney sends. I don't even like tell borrowers anymore. It's just, here's, here's the packet. It's clearly outlined in the closing statement. Like that's the, the attorney cost 600 bucks. I've had a couple of them kind of say, Hey, what is this attorney cost? They say, well, you're paying my attorney. Otherwise we're not doing the deal. Uh, you know, it's just the way it works. Thou with the gold can makes the rules. I think they said, is that right, Craig? Or did I get that Ab wrong? Absolutely. Awesome. I think that comes from the uh, richest man in Babylon. I, exactly where it comes from. I've read that book so many times. All the, the, you know, the six laws of wealth that I created are all derivatives of, of that book. You know, the richest man in Babylon, the seven, uh, seven rules of gold. I think they called it. Brad said, Chris, your opinion changed. Has my opinion changed on IPG income fund? No, not at all. I, me and my wife are, are in that and it's, and like clockwork. So I, I can't endorse or promote or tell you to do it or not, but do your own due diligence. And I've done mine. I, I can tell you that much. And so far it's been great. 
Uh, Arthur's very easy to get a hold of. I've spoken to all the people in his company now. I finally, Craig, you were on that call, weren't you? Yeah, I was on. I was on. Yep. Yeah. You know, that was the only person I hadn't talked to. What'd you think of that call with uh, IPG's main uh, managing member? No, I, I thought it was a great call. I mean, I part of what I was trying to figure out is what's how does this really work? So just asking a lot of questions about who's doing what and why are they getting paid for this? So it's, you know, to your point, it, it's very important for everybody to kind of, you know, do your own due diligence and and find out about the deal and, and how it's structured. Absolutely. And that goes for private money club as well. You know, one of the things I like to do is I've been working with the same people and over and over, but before I met with them, it's just, I want to know who you are, why are you doing what you're doing? And one guy, I just loved his mission because he said, he's just trying to clean up his, um, you know, all the surrounding towns that he lives in. He's just trying to make, you know, nicer properties, better places for people to rent. And I liked his mission. So all comes down to knowing the people as well as the deal. 100%. And I just put in, uh, you know, somebody asked, uh, you know, how do I get into Private Money Club? PrivateMoneyClub.com. Or you can call 833-JOIN-PMC for a demo. So how'd everybody like today? A little different, right? Strictly business, self-employed, entrepreneurs. Is that a good uh, good session? You guys get something out of that? And we're also going to, yeah, good to see Lazy Cash back to work. Yep. <laughs> It's always late though. I'm telling you, I got to do something about this tardiness. One of the things too that Craig and I are working on with that equipment financing is, is a book. So in the not so far off future, we'll have a book that'll be free to all of you. And that book will basically outline everything we just taught today. And then some more about how you can use privatized banking and the infinite banking concept in your business. And you can kind of apply it, see the numbers. But the best thing to do always is just book a call with us. I mean, I put the link up there. I'll put it up one more time. Uh, if any of you want to book a call with any of our money mentors, here's the link and also the 90 minute video. If you're brand new to this, I gave you the 90 minute, but right at the bottom, it's easy. It's mentors.beyourownbanker.com. And that's how you would book a call. So feel free to book a call. There's no cost for it. No one's going to try to sell you something. Matter of fact, actually, we've been criticized more times about that. Because people are like, well, you know, they didn't ask me, you know, if I wanted to, to get started. I'm like, yeah, we, we're here to teach you and you can ask us to help you get it started if you're ready. So with that being said, yeah, how can I flip a forklift? <laughs> we are all over the place today. So again, beyourownbank.com. So if anyone's interested in flipping forklifts, so put that in and then you'll see the forklift video and then just schedule a call. My wife is getting attacked by Cash. Cash is uh, wow. is definitely on fire. He is not a happy kitty because we're moving. So folks, thanks everybody for joining us for Wealth Webinar. We will see you next time and I'm going to continue this conversation. I just wanted to cut the recording. So we'll see you. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them. But I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you want to know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button. Actually, smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.